everybody today we will be having a look a review of kawasaki disease so i think it's nothing new so it's just to brush up the ideas and uh, the original uh, presentation was directed towards the post graduates the newly uh, entrants to our institute so it was basically for them uh, but again we will try to brush up um, in a nutshell the knowledge of kawasaki disease in 1967 an original article entitled infantile acute febrile mucocutaneous lymph node syndrome clinical observations of 50 cases was published so this was published in the japanese journal of allergy in in the japanese language uh, actually the author uh, initially his observation was uh, not looked well upon by his uh, academic academic and uh, academician colleagues in uh, tokyo and so he published in a not very uh, renowned journal in 2002 the original article was translated into english jane burns who is the head of uh, the center for kawasaki diseases she was one of the translators of the article and she commented in his exhaustive detailing of every observable aspect of the disease kawasaki was part sherlock holmes and part charles dickens with his sense of mystery and his vivid descriptions of the clinical features of this patients so let us have a look at the disease so diagnosis of kawasaki disease uh, everyone should agree that uh, it's more of a clinic acumen diagnosing the disease so fever for 5 days so that is the number one thing a fever unexplained by any other known clinical entity of course presently you can diagnose even early at 3 to 4 days if you are very certain if the characteristics the clinical characteristics are very florid so even by day 4 you can diagnose and give ivig to the patients so let us have a look at the classical clinical characteristics of the disease number 1 it is bilateral non purulent bulbar conjunctivitis so every word is important it's a non purulent so there should not be any discharge in the eyes bilateral bulbar so the palpebral conjunctiva is relatively spared so that is the first observation that dr kawasaki made number 2 mucositis so a redness of strawberry tongue along with lips and remember this 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 involvement of the lips this dry cracked fissured lips red dry cracked fissured lips is very very characteristic of kawasaki and this also helps in distinguishing it from scarlet fever which is one of the good differentials now three changes in the extremities so you can have uh, edema as well as erythema of the palms and soles not to forget the extreme irritability the irritability which is disproportionate to the degree of fever which is predominantly observed in infants and one should always remember that this can be just one of the clinical presentations of kawasaki disease a child or a baby rather an infant presenting with extreme irritability so one of the causes of a baby presenting with persistent cry one should remember that kawasaki can be one of the presentations of a persistent cry then you can have a rash so there's no fixed rash there's no fixed definition of rash so it can be of any form 
but it should not be a vesicular rash or a pustular rash. So a vesiculopustular lesion almost rules out the diagnosis of Kawasaki. So you can have various forms of rash. You can see this erythematous, sometimes measly, often scarlety form. Uh, this is a rash resembling like a uh, erythema multiforme, sometimes erythroderma like rash. So you can have varieties of rash in Kawasaki disease. So these are just some of the pictures of the patients. This was, a, you can see this florid rash, almost like an articarial rash. They are rarely itchy. And then excoriations. So the classical excoriations are the periungual excoriations, but they are a little late. They usually come after the seven days. What can precede the periungual discomations are the perineal discomations. So if a child presents day seven, always remember to look at the anal and the genital uh, area. So you can come up with this unusual excoriations, this perianal excoriation. And again, you can see the scrotum over here, there's some excoriations over here. Cervical lymphadenopathy. So amongst the classical clinical features, this is relatively a little rare presentation. It is usually a unilateral lymphadenopathy, unilateral cervical lymphadenopathy. But one must always remember that Kawasaki can occasionally present with a, this, a lymph node like this, a red, uh, red inflamed lymph node resembling a suppurative lymphadenitis. So uh, even if it looks, but if you have patients presenting with other features of Kawasaki, remember that Kawasaki can rarely, rarely present with a lymph node resembling a suppurative lymphadenitis. So this is one of the features that has been recently described as a Kawasaki feature. So a child presenting with fever, torticolis, and pain in the throat, you do a MRI of the neck, suspecting to it to be a retropharyngeal abscess. And this is what you get. You get a retropharyngeal edema. You can see the marked edema in the posterior part of the pharynx. So this marked edema on the posterior part of the pharynx. This is not a suppurative lesion. This is an inflammatory edema. It's a non-suppurative edema of the retropharynx. And retropharyngeal phlegmon, so that is one of the presentations of Kawasaki disease. Uh, this is the classical BCG acceleration scar. So many years after the BCG or many months after the BCG has been originally given, you can see that there's again some redness or edema around the BCG mask. So this is not a very, very common finding. It's present around five to 10 percent of the patients but it is almost pathognomic of Kawasaki disease. So a child presenting with fever for some days, uh, unexplained fever, always have a look at the BCG side, because if you come up with a BCG acceleration, this is almost pathognomic of Kawasaki disease. So it is present around 10 to 15 percent of the patients, and sometimes it can be quite distinct like over here, or it can be very subtle like over here. So Remember that BCG scar reactivation is very, very pathognomic of Kawasaki disease. Uh, this was a changes in the nails that we had originally described. Uh, it was first published in the International Journal of Dermatology in 2010. So this, uh, this coloration of the nails, this orange brown pigmentation over the nails. So this was uh, something uh, which we came across. We didn't know what was the cause. So you can see almost as if someone has applied Mehendi over here. In fact, that was the first question I asked to the patient that did you apply Mehendi? So the answer was no. So we, we, we were a little confused what it is. And then we came across in successive patients this finding and this was fi finally published. It was published as a case series again in Rheumatology International. And subsequently we have a recent publication also 
in the Indian uh, Journal of Pediatric Dermatology. And this is now almost universally recognized. So uh, following our initial publication, various centers uh, from globally, they have noticed this change in the nails and uh, from, from Europe to South America to different Asian uh, countries, they have noticed this. And so it is uh, universally now accepted uh, the, as a change. Yes. And it is not uncommon. It can be noted in almost 60 to 65% of the patients. And this is one change that can be appreciated in the acute phase because the periungual discommission, which is a classical nail change that comes more often in the subacute phase. And this change comes around four to five days. So always remember to have a look at the nails. You may come across this finding. So Kawasaki, if you look at the diagnostic criteria of Kawasaki, so it has not changed over the last 50 years since the original description uh, by Dr. Tomisaku Kawasaki. So the, it's a clinical diagnosis. So it remains a clinician's delight to diagnose a classical Kawasaki patient. So four out of five classical criteria. So what are the investigations? So basically the investigations are to rule out the differentials and then you need to diagnose the incomplete or the atypical Kawasaki disease. So the importance of the investigations lies over here. So definitely all patients of fever should have a blood count done. So if you have a patient with, so this is the AHA, the American Heart Association guideline for diagnosis of suspected or incomplete Kawasaki disease. So anemia for age, thrombocytosis. So this is one of the most classical features. So all infections, either the platelet count remains the same or the platelet count goes down. So in a patient of fever and a high CRP, if you encounter thrombocytosis, one should be very, very, very suspicious. So always remember to have a look at the platelet count because this carries a big significance. In fact, some of the patients just present without any other feature, just high CRP and thrombocytosis and the platelet count goes up, up and up. So remember thrombocytosis is a very, very important clinical finding. And then you can have the hypoalbuminemia, elevated SGOTs and SGPTs, thrombocytosis, uh, uh, leukocytosis, neutrophilic leukocytosis, and a sterile pyuria. We have occasionally encountered patients of Kawasaki being treated as UTI. So remember that this is a sterile pyuria. And the CRP, they have written it's equal to or more than three milligrams per DL. So the usual uh, CRP that we do is in milligrams per liter in most of the centers in Calcutta is milligrams per liter. It should be 30 equal to or more than 30 milligrams per liter and an ESR of more than 40 millimeter. And again, this is where the importance of echocardiography comes in. So a classical Kawasaki disease remains a clinical diagnosis. If you have excluded the the close differentials. So for that, one may not, if the echocardiography is, or a pediatric cardiologist is not readily available at the center, one can go ahead and give the IVIG. So day five, day six of fever, the child has all the classical features. A pediatric cardiologist is not available. You can still diagnose as Kawasaki disease because a classical Kawasaki is a clinical diagnosis. You have ruled out the other possibilities. You can go ahead and give the IVIG, but only when you don't have the classical features, you are in two minds, then the importance of echocardiography. Uh, some related investigations. Uh, Procalcitonin levels are usually normal, some, some have, uh, because some uh, centers that do procal to rule out an infection. But again, this is one condition where you can have very high procals. And procalcitonin level, if it is high in a patient of KD, 
that's a bad marker because these are the patients who are IVIG resistant and they have a higher incidence of coronary artery involvement. A cardiac enzyme, NT pro BNP, the pro brain natriotic peptide levels, it, has of, uh, it is a biomarker which is, of, which is gaining important recently. So it has been estimated that the levels are elevated in majority of the KD patients and serum levels more than 225 picograms per ml can assist. It is not pathognomic, but it can assist in the diagnosis of Kawasaki disease. In fact, uh, one of my PGs presently is doing a thesis on this, the anti pro BNP levels in other fevers as well as in relation to in Kawasaki disease. And we have found a significant, uh, significant difference in patients of Kawasaki disease. So hopefully in some time we will have the final figures and then we'll be able to discuss it in more detail. Another uh, interesting in, uh, investigation that we were doing, the interleukin-6 and CRP, we were comparing. This was, again, a thesis of one of our PGs, and she could get it published in a good journal. So she, the, the, the finding was that higher levels of interleukin-6 and CRP at diagnosis are associated with occurrence of coronary artery lesions and IVIG resistance. So IVIG resistance and coronary artery lesions are related to the higher levels of these inflammatory markers. Now, let us look at some of the atypical presentations that we have come across. Nephrotic syndrome in Kawasaki disease. So this was a child who had presented with nephrotic syndrome with some features of Kawasaki, and we treated the Kawasaki and the nephrotic syndrome subsided. Macrophage activation syndrome we'll discuss in detail later on. And this was a child who had presented with bilateral ptosis. So a KD patient with a peripheral neuropathy, and this is, you can see, the improvement following the IVIG. A 23-day-old baby presenting with fever for seven days. History of a conjunctivitis, this mucositis, and a measly rash, and this marked edema of the extremities. So, and this baby incidentally had a little thrombocytopenia. One should remember that though thrombocytosis is pathognomic of Kawasaki, but if you encounter a patient with relative thrombocytopenia, that's a bad prognostic marker because they have a higher incidence of coronary artery aneurysms. And that is what happened to this baby. This baby had coronary artery, multiple coronary artery aneurysms. This was published later on. So possibly this is one of the youngest uh, case reports of KD, a KD in a neonet. Again, uh, entity which is gathering ground recently, the Kawasaki disease shock syndrome. So this is because of the associated myocarditis. So these are the patients who have uh, severe myocarditis. Actually, uh, there was an interesting a paper from uh, Dr. Najib Dada uh, from Toronto. So he said that Kawasaki is not only coronary arthritis, it is also myocarditis. And his, uh, so what he said that, so untreated Kawasaki disease has around 20 to 25% incidence of coronary artery involvement. So that is from the historical cohort when we were not giving IVIG when IVIG was not a known treatment. But with IVIG, definitely it has come down to around less than 5%, 1 to 5%. But he's, what he says that almost all patients of Kawasaki has some amount of myocarditis. And these are the patients, this shock syndrome, they are usually young children around six months to two years who present with hypotension and very high inflammatory markers. And sometimes they go into this uh, MODS. So this is a baby who had presented with extreme edema. We were almost certain that this is what we are dealing with is a toxic shock syndrome till we could realize that there are some aneurysms in the uh, echocardiography. So this was the first baby. Subsequently, we have come across another three or four patients of Kawasaki shock syndrome. And 
uh, IVIG should be given because IVIG and a lot of times they will require steroids as well as in IVIG. Now, just to, uh, because we are encountering another entity nowadays, uh, the MISC, the post-COVID hyperinflammatory syndrome. So that also presents with hypotension and shock. But usually what is encountered, the MISC children, usually they are more than five years of age. And this KDS is the shock syndrome in Kawasaki is usually they're a little younger children, less than two years of age. And this was a two month old baby, but presented just with fever for 15 days. There was no other significant clinical finding except the baby on investigation had significant thrombocytosis and a very high CRP. And this baby had giant aneurysms, multiple giant aneurysms. And one of the aneurysms was almost the size of the aorta. So it, it, it was a shocker for the echocardiologist when they realized that this baby had an aneurysm the size of an aorta. And there was a clot as well as inside the aneurysm. So we had to go for thrombolysis in the baby. So that's a different story altogether. But again, one must remember that infants, especially less than one year of age, and they have very atypical presentations and they may not present with any other finding other than fever. And this was a patient of a missed, missed, uh, missed Kawasaki. So this is a story. Uh, this, this was a baby around six months of age who had presented with fever, treated with IV antibiotics, high inflammatory markers, the fever subsides. Now, one must remember that Kawasaki, by definition, is a self-limited vasculitis. Majority of the times, even without treatment, the fever may subside by 10 to 14 days. And this is what happened in this baby. And at around nine months of age, the baby presented with a swelling in the axilla, which was thought of to be a lymph node. But one missed clinically that it was a little pulse satire. So before the surgeon was almost ready to incise the swelling, a USG was done and the USG picked up the vascular nature of the swelling. So this child was subsequently investigated. A whole body CTO angio was done and there were multiple giant aneurysms, not only in the coronary arteries, but in some major arteries as well. You can see the axillary aneurysm and here are some iliac aneurysms giant aneurysms in the iliac arteries. The baby is otherwise stable, but this was a story of a mixed, uh, of a missed Kawasaki. So I don't know uh, really how many we really still miss. Uh, we may, may be missing definitely a lot considering the self-limiting nature of the fever in this condition. So what is not Kawasaki disease? So the differentials. A lot of infectious conditions can resemble Kawasaki disease or occasionally it has been noted that uh, Kawasaki may be a post infectious vasculitis. A lot of, a lot of um, viruses like adenovirus, parvovirus, measles virus, and presently the coronavirus has been found in association with Kawasaki disease. But remember that Kawasaki is a syndrome and all this infectious, uh, and we really do not know the etiology of the disease. Possibly it is some interaction of the environment and an infection factor in a genetically predisposed individual. So a lot of infectious conditions, streptococcus, staphylococcus, they have also been implicated as uh, causes of Kawasaki disease, the superantigen theory. Then immune reactions, Steven Johnson syndrome, serum sickness, they can mimic Kawasaki because of the erythroderma, the rash, the eye involvement, and rheumatic diseases like PAN and systemic GIA. In fact, Kawasaki was initially known as infantile PAN. A lot of people used to call it an infantile polyarthritis nodosa. And systemic GIA, we will have a look what really is the difference. 
So this is a child who had presented with features of cows, like you can see, the red lips, the rashes, the changes in the extremities, and this was the x-ray. So there was a pneumonia, and it was a staphylococcal pneumonia who had presented with features of Kawasaki disease. So uh, we treated the pneumonia, the, the, everything subsided. Another baby who had presented with features resembling Kawasaki, only what was missed that there was a labial abscess. So again, so as I said that all patients of Kawasaki should have a perineal and a perianal examination. So, and this is what we picked up, a uh, uh, vulval abscess and the toxin mediated uh, features of KD. So one of the infections that I sometimes find very difficult to distinguish is strap diapers. So if you have the pathognomic scar, it becomes very easy, but that pathognomic that the, the pathognomic S chart is rarely present. So because even in scrub, they present with fever, rashes, lymphadenopathy, uh, encephalopathy. So you can have almost everything like a PKD patient. But one must remember that usually the encephalopathy in Kawasaki presents like a very irritable. But these are the children in, in scrub, what I've usually encountered, they are a little uh, they are a little. Uh, they they are not irritable. They are uh, they are not comatose, but they are not. They are a little unresponsive sort of, and uh, and the counts are not very high in scrub, and the platelet is again not very high. So again, a blood count possibly helps in sometimes distinguishing, and again one must remember that scrub is another condition where you can have temporary dilatation of the coronary arteries. You do not have an aneurysm, but you can have a temporary dilatation of the coronary arteries, which subsides and which can be basically associated with any febrile condition because of the uh, increased circulation to the heart. So sometimes these mistakes are made that scrub resembling KD. So uh, systemic arthritis mimicking Kawasaki at onset. Uh, these are usually infants and toddlers presents with, presents like an incomplete Kawasaki. They present with fever, maybe some rash, plus minus mucositis, raised inflammatory markers, and the eco may sometimes pick up a little coronary dilatation. As I said, a lot of conditions can have temporary coronary dilatations and they are usually IVIG resistant. Either uh, IVIG, they respond and the fever comes back or they do not respond at all. So again, one must remember that systemic arthritis can occasionally mimic KD at onset. So why identify Kawasaki? Is it a, just a pleasure of the clinicians? One must remember that this is a vasculitis and it has a propensity, an unusual propensity of affecting the coronary arteries. Why? The answer is still not known. But untreated, as I say that the historical cohort had around 20 to 25 incidents of coronary artery aneurysms. It is the commonest cause of myocardial infarction in children especially in those with persistent aneurysms, with thrombus within the aneurysms. And one must remember that MI in children can have, again, a very, very subtle presentation, a very unusual presentation. They can, again, present with just uh, maybe sweating, maybe irritability, maybe vomiting. So a very, very unusual presentation, not the classical chest pain. They can present with just an abdominal pain. So it's not easy to diagnose myocardial infarction in children. So the distribution of arthritis in Kawasaki, so coronaries are the predominant affection, around 96% coronary affection, but you can have occasionally large arteries involved as well. Remember the renal arteries can be involved 
and sometimes though it is a predominantly a medium and small vessel vasculitis but rarely the aorta has also been involved so there are reports of 6.2 percent of patients having aorta involvement so what are the histologic histological characteristics so this is a monomodal inflammatory disorder so it comes once only it's like a storm it's like the amphan it comes and it destroys and it, then it passes off and what remains is the scar of that original storm so it does not go on like majority of the other vasculitis so it's not a lingering thing it comes strikes and leaves and again it's a self limited disorder that i said it peaks rapidly and subsides gradually predominant to the medium sized artery but again a wide extension from small to large vessels and very important there's synchronous affection throughout the body so there's no mixtures of acute and chronic lesions so it strikes and it strikes completely so if you look at the pathology the the macrophages and the neutrophils are the main components of the infiltrating cells lymphocytes make up only an insignificant portion and as compared to some of the other uh, immune mediated vasculitis there are no immune deposits and there are no fibrinoid necrosis like the anca associated vasculitis and the pan so let us look at the morphogenesis of the coronary artery aneurysm in relation to the number of days so 6 to 8 days there's some edematous dissociation of the tunica media 8 to 10 days proliferative granulomatous inflammation of the intima and adventitia and there's a pan arteritis 8 to 10 days and by 10 to 12 days there's destruction of the arterial wall and arterial expansion so around 12 days the aneurysm formation is more or less done so if you do a echocardiography very early say around before 7 days possibly the echocardiography won't pick up anything so if you are suspicious give ivig repeat echo and maybe repeat echo subsequently again because the initial echo by day 5 day 6 may not pick up anything because that is the if you look at the morphogenesis of the aneurysms this is what happens and timing of peak coronary artery dilatation so the peak coronary artery dilatation occurs at an average of 14 to 15 days after the onset of fever uh, among patients with normal echocardiography 10.2% record an abnormal echo on follow up so one must always that is the importance of repeating the echoes even if the echo is normal it does not necessarily mean it will remain normal you can have an abnormal echo on follow up and among those with abnormal initial echo that is z score more than 2 27 to 30% experienced an increase in z score on follow up and again that is the importance of going on repeating the echo till 6 weeks because that has been observed that the changes do not occur beyond 6 weeks of all patients with dilatation at the convalescent phase 23% had normal initial echoes so again the initial echo may be normal so it's important to go on repeating the echoes although the disease is a one time disease but the scarring may not be evident initially so let us look, look at the goals of therapy so you need to control the acute inflammation and prevent long term sequelae that is the coronary artery abnormalities so how to treat i think everyone knows in this how to treat kawasaki it is ivig 2 grams per kg and it has been observed that the response to ivig is a dose dependent response so it is 2 grams per kg and it remains one of the most cost effective medical therapies one must remember that uh, if the child definitely lands up with an aneurysm then that will be uh, causing number of visits to the cardiologist and a lifelong follow up so even if it is an expensive proposition 
one must go ahead and treat. So those dependent, as I said, it should be administered over eight to 12 hours, maybe 16 hours and timing at diagnosis. So preferably best within the first seven days, definitely by 10 days. If someone diagnosed a Kawasaki disease early, before five days, you can go ahead and treat. But again, remember that giving IVIG early, there's a higher incidence of IVIG uh, resistance. Possibly the reason is that these babies have very high inflammation. And that is the reason they presented with all the features so early. So that was the reason possibly you could diagnose so early. And maybe that is one, one of the reasons that they, have, they do not respond to the IVIG, but they will maybe require retreatment. So, but there's nothing uh, that 10 days watershed done is not a sanctum sanctorum. It is nothing, it's not the holy grail. So even if a patient comes beyond 10 days, and if the patient is febrile, if the child has high inflammatory markers, and if the child happened to have some coronary changes, go ahead and give. So it might do a world of good to this child. So there's nothing uh, sanctum sanctorum about that 10 days watershed zone. It was basically arbitrarily fixed up. So if the patient event presenting late, with aneurysm, you need to treat that baby because it has been observed that, uh, that inflammation may persist in the blood vessels, even if the baby is not mounting any febrile response. So IVIG reduces the incidence of coronary through one to 5%. And usually the defervescence is quite prompt, but remember the irritability may persist for days. Side effects, it's, it's a very, very safe drug. Occasionally you can have infusion reactions. So the dictum is to start the infusion slowly and then you can increase the rapidity of the infusion. Some patients may complain of a headache because of an aseptic meningitis uh, and it can last up to 72 hours after the infusion. And sometimes you can have some hemolysis. Aspirin is a controversial drug again in also Kawasaki. So the high dose aspirin was initially used. Then it was 30 to 50 mg per kg. And even some papers, there are some papers that say now that you don't need to give at least the 30 to 50. You can just give the three to five. That is the antiplatelet dose of aspirin. So there was a paper you can see that high dose aspirin is associated with anemia and does not confer benefit to disease outcomes in Kawasaki disease. <coughs> so. Uh, presently, of course, at our center, we use around 30 to 50 mg per kg, but I know of centers who are using only the anti-platelet dose of aspirin from the very beginning. Uh, so the risk of transaminitis, occasionally rare syndrome, and not to be used, used for the associated arthritis. So, so what are the patients, when the patient does not respond to IVIG, so the patient, you have given IVIG. So the patient's fever does not subside. Some say 36, some say 48 hours. Or there's recrudescence of the fever within two weeks without any other known explanation for the fever. So these are the IVIG non-responders. And one must remember that 10 to 15% of patients will not respond to the first dose of IVIG. In fact, the patient, parents should be counseled possibly that there's a chance that the child will not respond. 90% will respond. So the options, there's, uh, you can, if you look at the age recent guidelines, so you can go for a second dose of IVIG, but again, there's a 30% incidence of resistance to the second dose of IVIG. You can use a different or a better brand, maybe some international brand. Third dose of IVIG, no one usually gives that. Pulse methyl prednisolone, 30 mg per kg for three days, maybe tried. What we use at our center over the last four years is infliximab. So that's a TNF blocker. And uh, 
we have been using infliximab for the last four years in all patients who fail to respond to IVIG with a good success, I must say. So there are other drugs which have been tried, cyclophosphamide, methotrexate, uh, other TNF blockers. But one must remember that tocilizumab should not be used because tocilizumab, although the fever comes down, but there's a higher incidence of coronary artery aneurysm subsequently. So a controversial topic, the role of steroids, but presently following the Ray study and that publication in Lancet 2012. So prednisolone uh, has been used in Japanese children. So uh, a prednisolone 2 mg per kg over 15 days uh, should be continued after the CRP concentration normalizes. So it has now accepted uh, regimen for using. And this was a publication in JAMA in 2016 corticosteroids combined with IVIG as an initially therapy showed more protective effect, but what they say it's more pronounced in high risk subjects. So what are the high risk subjects? So there's a risk scoring system, the Kobayashi score, if you do the Kobayashi scoring, if it is equal to or more than five, the score, uh, then it's a high risk subject, then there's a SANO score. So these scores have not been utilized, have not been uh, really tried in the Indian population. Again, uh, one of our PGs is currently doing a study and she's coming up with some interesting results, I think. Uh, now, infliximab. So, this was a study from uh, Japan, a post marketing surveillance in Japan. Uh, so, uh, they said that infliximab for patients with acute KD refractory to conventional therapies are effective and well tolerated. And uh, this is a paper again for treatment intensification in patients with KD with aneurysms at diagnosis. So patients presenting with aneurysms at diagnosis do not just give IVIG, you top up the treatment with either, either steroids or infliximab. So this is an unpublished data from our center uh, around 32 patients have received infliximab and uh, two patients were actually systemic arthritis mimicking KD. So the rest 30 patients, they all responded very well to infliximab. And in fact, uh, uh, another thing that we came across that the effect of the aneurysms, some of the aneurysms, they, there was a definite diminution. You can see that almost 70% of the uh, aneurysms had some diminution in size. And if nothing responds, if everything fails, then you can try plasma pheresis. Anticoagulation, so patients with giant aneurysm, thrombus inside, or associated stenosis, you have to give uh, maybe a thrombolytic, like a TPA, or a, or a, um, uh, and you have to follow up with heparin. Maintain uh, uh, the INR, um, heparin and maybe f substitute with warfarin, but usually uh, because warfarin and INR is very, very difficult to maintain in uh, uh, children, young children, sometimes we just follow up with the, uh, the LMWH only. So arthritis, 5 to 10% of patients can have associated arthritis, a reactive arthritis subsequently, you can just give a short course of NSAID and steroid. So role of the pediatric cardiologist, Acute Kawasaki disease is the domain of pediatricians and the pediatric rheumatologists. The pediatric cardiologist comes in in cases of complications. Definitely for the echocardiography, we need a pediatric cardiologist because they are the ones who can really look at the coronary arteries. So if you have a, if someone requires a cardiac catheter intervention or angioplasty stenting bypass, so these are the roles of the cardiologist. So, uh, so what happens if the patient fails to respond? Definitely we have looked at the drugs, but one again should uh, suspect whether we are really dealing with Kawasaki if the patient is failing to respond. Sometimes it's important to revise the diagnosis. As I said that occasionally systemic GIA patients can resemble Kawasaki at onset. So there are various papers, you can see there are some, lots of publications. We have also burnt our fingers 
at least four to five times uh, we had diagnosed KD. We had encountered some dilatation of the coronary arteries and they had subsequently landed up with arthritis in, in subsequent months. And do not forget that macrophage activation syndrome can result from Kawasaki disease as well. So we had this patient who responded, but again started having fever with bleeding manifestations and subsequently this child was treated with pulse methylprednisolone. So this was published in 2014. Uh, the echocardiography has some limitations. Uh, so coronary artery aneurysms, as I said, it takes some around a week to appear. And one must remember that the echocardiography cannot pick up the distal arteries. So we initially see majority of the majority of the time, the proximal part of the arteries. So the distal part of the arteries are missed and small arteries sometimes we may not be able to pick up. And for that, uh, we can have something uh, which is uh, uh, this is a dual source uh, CT coronary angiography. Um, so it is being used in specific, especially PGI Chandigarh. They are getting extensively good results. In fact, patients who, who had normal uh, coronary art, um, cor uh, normal echocardiographies done by repeatedly by pediatric cardiologists, they had turned out with multiple giant aneurysms. So, uh, uh, but this is again in a single center. And repeat echocardiography, uh, not only if, if, if the patient is, has aneurysms to be seen, it, sometimes you can have to repeat the echocardiography, not even before two weeks. Maybe sometimes you need to do every two to three days to look at what is happening to the aneurysm. But definitely one should follow up with echocardiography at least at two and six weeks. So what are the fate? Majority of the small aneurysms will regress over a period of one to two years. It is the giant aneurysms which are the problems. So there's a risk stratification, and this is comes most of it, most importantly, in uh, for the long term follow up. And this is the domain again for the cardiologist. Now this is the cardiological domain, the long term follow up of cardiac Kawasaki disease, the patients with the aneurysm. So so again, this, this is an I think a completely different talk altogether. Uh, so this is very important that vessels show histological and functional abnormalities at the sides of the healed aneurysms. And vascular reactivity to endogenous vesolidators remains abnormal, regardless of whether they have detectable coronary abnormalities. So Kawasaki is a, not a one-time disease. It, it is a lifelong disease. Although, so lifelong follow-up is required. So just uh, one or two slides more. Uh, I will end off with uh, some words of wisdom written by the Indian Kawasaki Professor Surjit Singh. To the uninitiated, the di diagnosis of KD may seem like an enigma. There seems to be more of art than science in arriving at a diagnosis of KD. I think people who diagnose KD know this and it remains a purely clinical diagnosis, especially that classical Kawasaki. And this is a book, uh, uh, this is from the, the Gita of uh, pediatric rheumatologist, Cassidy's textbook. The consequence of failure to treat a child appropriately with KD are so important that error on the side of premature or unnecessary therapy is preferable to delayed or missed therapy for a child for whom the diagnosis is a little uncertain. So uh, one should possibly go ahead and treat. So even if you are in doubt, even if you are in slightest doubt, go ahead and treat because we have encountered, we have shown uh, what happens if you do not treat. So final slide. So any child with fever and the classical features, when to suspect? infant with disproportionate irritability and persistent crying, any infant with a pyrexia of unknown origin, fever with unexplained rising platelets, unexplained shock in a young baby, and then babies with cervical lymphadenopathy and rashes, the list goes on. One must think Kawasaki disease to diagnose the condition. So these are some of the pictures from uh, 
uh, my visit to the uh, Kawasaki Disease uh, International Conference in Tokyo. Uh, something happened. Uh, I think you have just stopped sharing. Everything is oh, fine. Okay, okay. Uh, oh, sorry, sir. Just, 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 just the last slide, huh? Just the last. Slide. So you can see that. There's a big representation from India and Professor Singh uh, is unmistakable by his presence. And uh, this is my fanboy picture with the man himself. Uh, so uh, Dr. Kawasaki passed away on June 5th this year. So we remain indebted to the man for his discovery. Thank you. Yankar, there are a lot of questions in the question answer and chat box. I think you can address few of them. Okay, okay, okay. Question answer. Okay, okay. Was the child with pneumonia treated with IVIG as well? No, the child received only antibiotics. Stop sharing the screen and then answer. Okay, okay. Stop sharing. Okay. Any difference of IL-6 status in Kawasaki and COVID-related cytokine storm? Uh, we are encountering these patients. I think uh, we are doing some uh, this cover. Uh, we have not actually, uh, we have not correlated the data. So we, uh, the COVID related cytokine storm, uh, we have encountered five or six patients at our institute also. Uh, so we are gathering the data, but we have not really uh, done any uh, study uh, uh, with the Kawasaki patients. So maybe we will uh, do it definitely. Thank, thanks for the suggestion. Uh, how do you explain the monomodal inflammation in recurrent Kawasaki, which is though rare but occurred? Yes, uh, the incidence of recurrent Kawasaki is less than 0.3%. Uh, as far as I remember, the, it's, it's extremely low. Um, but monomodal inflammation, the recurrent KD is, we have seen one patient of recurrent KD who had, uh, who presented with Kawasaki even months after the initial uh, initial presentation. So uh, again, something to do with uh, the, the, the cytokine, the inflammatory response. Uh, but the presentation for a single episode is a monomodal presentation. That is what I wanted to say. Uh, does Kawasaki run in families? Um, I think there are occasional reports of uh, babies in the same family getting affected, but um, they are not very common. Multisystem inflammatory syndrome, if COVID negative, how do they differ from Kawasaki disease? Uh, majority of the multisystem inflammatory syndrome, though they are RTPC or negative, they are turning out to be COVID antibody positive. So uh, difference from Kawasaki, uh, so majority of Kawasaki patients are young patients, less than five years. And what has been uh, observed in, um, in the, um, the COVID, the majority of the MIST patients, they are usually a little five years and above. And they present with very, very high CRP. The counts may not be very high. The platelet is relatively normal. So that is one of the things which differentiates from uh, KD. The platelet in MISC usually not, uh, they are usually normal to begin with. And that is one of the important clinical differentiators. And MISC patients, they predominantly present with shock, hypotension and shock. And they sometimes have other, other systems involvement as well, especially encephalopathy, GI involvement. Uh, what is Chronology of various signs on day, on day, day to day. day. Okay, uh, uh, there's no chronology actually, so that is very important. One must remember that uh, none of the signs of KD 
individual is pathognomic, pathognomic of the disease. So, uh, and, and, and uh, they, so individually, none of the signs are pathognomic. You have to see it as a whole. And it sometimes happens that they may not be present at the same time in a single patient. So a child may be giving of a history of a transient redness of the eyes or a transient rash on day two of fever. And now that the child has presented on day five to you, the child may not be having anything. So if in doubt, if you think you should question. So there's no chronology. It is, uh, it can appear and it may not be present in a single patient at one given point of time. Sorry, just, just a minute, my battery is running. No, battery. Priyankar. Hello. Uh, Priyankar. Uh. I would just like to I would just like to mention uh, that in 1980 uh, Dr. Patal came for the round and he said can it be mucopitoneous lymphoglandular syndrome in those days the Kawasaki name was not that popular though it was published by uh, Dr. Kawasaki but the name Kawasaki oh, came from and the uh, second thing is that the first publication of Kawasaki disease from Institute of Child Health, you didn't show, and it was uh, Probal Orunalok and Dr. Subroto Chakraborty, palatal palsy in Kawasaki disease in 2000, when you just joined. Yes, sir. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, 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 what happens to D-dimer in case of Kawasaki? Uh, D-dimer we routinely do not do. But definitely, if a patient has a macrophage activation, the D-dimer will be very high. But in multi-inflammatory system, D-dimers assay is always D-dimers. Yes, yes. But you don't say anything in Kawasaki. And one more question I want to ask. When we should repeat CRT after giving IVIG? We usually do after 48 hours. So after 48 hours? 48 hours, yes. So you don't expect the CRP to come down before 48 hours. So sometimes it takes some time. It yes. takes some time. And so once that, not never repeat a ESR. That is very important because yes. ESR should never be repeated because IVIG itself causes a rise in ESR. So ESR elevated following IVIG has no importance. If the fever subsides, if the fever subsides, what's the point in repeating the CRP? Uh, sir, uh, at times we, we also see that no, CRP should also no, come if, down. If the, no, no, sir, if, if the CRP continues to be elevated, one should then, follow then, up this patient actually. Yes. Because some sir, of them are, have uh, often increasing happens. aneurysms. What we have seen that uh, some of these patients, although the patient has responded to the IVIG, but the, present, the, the arteries keep on ballooning. Sir, so can some, I ask a question? Sometimes Sir. it happens. Priyanka, what we do, we repeat CRP after 24 hours. It is still high. And we think that it is not responding. So never ever repeat CRP okay. before 48 hours. And then only take decision whether it is responding or not. Sir, can I ask a question? Yes, sir. Please uh, go ahead. Priyanka, Priyanka sir. Yes, sir. Uh, Bolchi, uh, sir, uh, just one comment uh, regarding atypical presentation of Kawasaki. Uh, actually, from but our department, nice from our department in PGI Chandigarh, actually we uh, published a case uh, report of a two-year-old child with Kawasaki uh, with intestinal obstruction. So uh, the child presented with intestinal obstruction, raised transactness, fever, high CRP. Uh, and subsequently, uh, we ruled out other causes of. Uh, intestinal obstruction and it came out to be Kawasaki and uh, that paper is also published. Uh, second, uh, one question that I'd like to ask that I have one confusion that uh, regarding this procal level, because usually what we think when there is high procal, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a bacterial infection. And if it is only high CRP, but procal normal, we think of inflammatory condition. But as you have shown, sir, even procal can be very high in Kawasaki. So, uh, so this can create a lot of confusion uh, in case of suspecting the So, sir, if you just enlighten us. Usually, majority of the times, 
we don't routinely do procal in kawasaki disease but some centers uh, they do procal as a part of the initial diagnostic workup of any fever patient so that is what i want to say that even if your procal is high it's not uh, the rule that high procal is equal to a bacterial infection so okay. high procal we have encountered in kawasaki disease which is a non infectious condition as well as in macrophage activation syndrome mass patients can have very very high procal so procal is basically again a marker of inflammation not a marker of infection so that is one should mm. remember that uh, it definitely yes. it helps in monitoring a patient with infection but again one should always look at the patient as a whole and not jump to any conclusions on one particular investigative finding okay so so it's just like crp it can be high in inflammatory condition also without yes, a yes, bacterial yes, infection yes 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 exactly exactly yes uh, there are some the vaccine and uh, kawasaki yes yes vaccine and kawasaki the most uh, vaccine and kawasaki following ivig oh vaccine yes 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 uh, usually uh, no vaccination for the next 3 months and no live vaccine for the next 11 months right acha there are uh, some questions in the chat box i think i should address any uh, sir one more of, uh, yes yes sir one more thing about uh, the inflix map actually in ibd what we follow is that uh, in uh, uh, inflix map we give at two uh, i mean 0 2 and then six weekly dose so mm -hmm. is that same protocol in uh, no, no, resistant no. kawasaki it, it, no it is a single 5 mg per kg dose it's a single dose okay. 5 mg per kg okay. although it's a single dose and usually if you do give infliximab we rule out tuberculosis in other settings but not in kawasaki so yes kawasaki patients okay. we go ahead and give infliximab we just make certain that there is no other infection but of course we definitely once we arrive at a diagnosis of kd there is no other infection and we do not screen for tuberculosis we just go ahead and give it's a single dose 5 mg per kg there are some so, papers some papers which say that uh, you should give a higher dose of 10 mg per kg uh, because uh, because of the bio availability of the drug because post ivig apparently the bio availability of the drug is a little less but we usually give 5 mg per kg sir the, sir one last question for you, uh, regarding this sir after the last question that giving infliximab giving infliximab without screening for tuberculosis can it result in medical legal cases because no. india being an endemic country no. there is chances of uh, flare up sir uh, no, 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 no people have been using infliximab in india a lot of centers have been using and none none has but in ibd we we routinely do sir in ibd yes, because you are giving screening. because you are giving recurrent doses recurrent doses but this is an acute condition which needs to be addressed acutely so uh, this is not a chronic disease so we don't repeat the infliximab and we do not do, and there has been as far as our knowledge goes it is not even recommended in okay. kkd and there are no reports also of any uh, tubercular uh, flare up following uh, infliximab in kkd okay. so let me address the questions in the chat box any role of statin yes there are there are uh, roles of statin in uh, acute kawasaki as well as uh, um, as well as some papers which say that patients with aneurysms uh, with giant aneurysm should be on statin in fact some of our patients we have been using statin along with other drugs uh, so i don't know exactly what is working but definitely some of them have responded and then um, ro bnp in prognosis of kawasaki disease uh prognosis it's usually mainly in diagnosis uh, rather uh, to have a look because of the myocardial inflammation you get the pro bnp i'm not certain whether it has any role in prognosis of kawasaki disease there's another question from calling the uh, role of dual antiplatelet uh dual antiplatelet yes i i, I will uh, dual no. antiplatelet in patients with no. giant aneurysms no. multiple aneurysms so over there there's no. definitely um you give a dual antiplatelet you give uh, aspirin as well, as well as covidogrel 
and 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 in cases of giant aneurysm you should also give an anticoagulant so that is important that anticoagulation should be there so just antiplatelet may not be sufficient enough in patients with giant aneurysm so over there you have to either give an oral anticoagulant warfarin but as i said that maintaining the uh, the required inr is almost a nightmare it is, is almost impossible in children with uh, warfarin so for a stable response some of the patients uh, we teach them if they can afford that but low molecular weight heparin continuing for months together is not an easy but uh, we have got really good results with continuing them for months together we teach the parents to administer to the child and they give the low molecular weight heparin at home so that way the response is at least much more stable but definitely warfarin we have tried in uh, some of our patients are getting with giant aneurysms pro bnp raised in acute phase due to my i think ashuparna has made a comment uh, 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 dr chandramouli has asked whether infliximab may become the first drug because ivig is broad spectrum there was some studies where where they used infliximab as the first drug uh which did not really show much benefit above ivig but uh, again uh, i think uh, in pgi there is a paper where they said that they used in one patient i know at because it was a little more cost effective uh, because a, a child with a big uh, a bigger body weight if you are giving ivig it's a quite a expensive proposition uh, a single dose of infliximab of 100 mg may be sufficient so they used in one patient because of economical reasons uh any other questions uh, are there any other questions i don't Do see anything dr priyankar can i ask a question yes yes i am dr paramjit from new delhi i am a senior pediatrician in rainbow children hospital and uh -huh. well, first of all extremely enlightening talk uh, with your senior boss uh, mr ritabrata he is uh, a well known personality uh, i mean uh, i have seen him in multiple forums and uh, to, to truly dedicate uh, myself uh, to such a learned personality and uh, so first uh, just wanted to have a, a one or two questions if you allow uh, one yeah, is yes, sir, yeah, one is uh, 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 i was hearing to a pediatric rheumatologist uh, in a webinar from uk so they are treating after ivig they said there uh, accordingly that the uh, the half life of ivig is 3 weeks so they, they are supposed to say that there is no role of second dose of ivig that is one part second they said in case the child does not respond to ivig they consider uh, 30 mg per kg that is the uh, of methylprednisolone uh, the three doses okay as the second line and uh, do not go for a ivig second dose what is your take on that because in our setups multiple people are using ivig and are not using steroids in the dose uh, which i have told you yes 2 mg per kg all the centers probably are using or many centers so what is your take on this uh, so uh, definitely uh, second dose of ivig we also are not using because as i said that there's a almost a 30% incidence of failure to the second dose of ivig uh, at our center we use infliximab uh, methylprednisolone definitely uh, but uh, i don't know what I, Uh, we are very very uh, happy with infliximab so for okay. the last 4 years we have been using infliximab at our centers but definitely methylprednisolone is a definite option it's a definite option and uh, as far as the ivig and infliximab i, uh, I think there's a trial going on in uh, usa uh, i think it's a kdk trial as far as i remember the name is kdk trial so where they have subjected blindly Uh, ivig resistant patients to ivig and infliximab possibly by 2021 it's a dr burns group as as far as i know that is conducting the trial so by 2021 um, that results will be available possibly thank you so much and my second question if you allow me is yes, sir. uh the in case have you come across the patient of 
Kawasaki, who has not responded even to infliximab? And have you considered uh, then IV steroids in that case in a bolus dose, methylprednisolone? Uh, so uh, luckily for us, <laughs> all our patients have till date responded to infliximab. But definitely, yes, if the patient does not respond to infliximab, we will definitely give IV uh, methylprednisolone. Have you come across uh, uh, Kawasaki disease with significant myocarditis? Yes, sir. Yes, yes. So the Kawasaki shock syndrome patients, they have then, significant myocarditis. Then it is uh, also interpreted that uh, instead of giving two gram, you give one gram on the first day and the second gram, as it has been explained that uh, it may have some uh, importance as far as dysfunction of myocardial function in such situation to go, yeah, slowly, go slowly and then maybe slowly, yes. in the... Okay. Go slowly, okay. yes. IVIGB gives slowly, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Your wonderful talk and uh, respected uh, Dr. Dittabrata, I'm your very uh, hardcore fan. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thanks for joining. Thank you, Priyanka. Sangatik Bhalo is a good oration. It's not a lecture. <laughs> I agree with it, Dr. Sir. <laughs> Uh, any any more questions? Uh, uh, I think Shubhodit has asked, is there a specific ECG change? No, there is no specific ECG change. So uh, you can give some non-specific STT changes uh, because of the myocarditis possibly you get some non-specific changes. There's no specific ECG change. So, uh, shall we close the session then? Excellent Sir? presentation, Kriyankar. Uh, thank you, Didi. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. So, uh, shall we close the session? Yes, yes. Sir? Huh. Okay, okay. Good night.